it up here so that I can see your beautiful faces in front of me. Um, my name is Max Stoiber. Uh, I actually live not too far away from where uh, Agent Kong should have been. I live in Vienna. Um, and I actually, this is kind of strange because for the first time in many, many years, I'm sitting in my bedroom, which might seem really weird, but it's because my sister actually moved in with me two weeks ago. And so now my office space is now her room and I had to move my desk to my bedroom. So this is the first time I'm giving a talk out of my bedroom. I'm just now realizing, which is why you can see my bed behind me. Uh, something I actually haven't considered. Maybe I need to turn my desk around or something. I'm gonna have to figure that out. Anyways, I'm Max. I am the co-founder of Grassidian. And sort of what I wanna talk about today is the journey of how we, how we got to Grassy. That whole story really started in 2018. I was working on a product at the time called Spectrum that was sort of a modern take on community forums, right? We were trying to combine the best of Discord and Slack with the best of static forums. So we were building um, essentially a, a forum platform where you could create a community for your group of people. And you could post threads and stuff like that, but then the comments would be real-time chat. And really, our, our goal was to essentially have something like Slack or Discord, but have it be search indexed, right? So you could find the content, the conversations that people were having on Google. Um, still, by the way, think that that's a brilliant idea. In case anyone's looking for an idea, please go build this. We really need it. Um, we, we ended up growing really quickly, particularly in the open source world, right? Many open source developers realized actually having the questions that people ask about my open source library be findable on Google is a really good idea because I end up not having to answer the same questions over and over and over again. And so we grew really quickly and with that came a lot of traffic. And at some point at the beginning of 2019, um, our servers were essentially on fire. We were crashing multiple times a day because we were under such high load. I actually Googled <laughs> servers on fire and I found this stock image that I think is hilarious. Because if your servers are this much on fire, you have a much, much larger problem. Like your data center is literally burning. This is not what our data center looked like, but our servers very much felt this way. They were just crashing every single day. Um, and it was really frustrating because our users were trying to talk to each other, but they couldn't because we had downtime. And it was really, really, really frustrating. And so as the maintaining the personal team, I was sort of tasked with trying to figure out how can we keep our systems up? Now, what's interesting about the use case that we had is that it's very, very read heavy and very public data that's being accessed a lot more than it is being changed, right? If you think about a forum, people post posts, of course, and people post comments, but 10 times, if not even 50 times more people read those posts and read those comments. And all of them were public anyway, right? Like that was the whole point. You, you were supposed to be able to find them on Google. So 99% of them were public. And we also had some direct messages, of course, and those weren't public. But most of our data was extremely read heavy and very, very public. And so in my head, I was like, okay, we're, we're using GraphQL because we also wanted to build mobile apps. And so we needed an API to be able to access data over the network. And I was like, well, how, how can I cache this data? How can I cache my API for all of these users? Because really, we had the perfect use case for caching, right? A really read-heavy public API doesn't get much better than that for caching, right? Like we should have been able to have a 99% cache hit rate if only we had any caching. And I looked around and nothing existed, literally nothing. Um, there's, a, there's many CDNs for REST APIs that can do caching, but for GraphQL, nothing really existed. And so I kind of, in order to solve our problem, I sat down and for two weeks or maybe more, four weeks, I built a terrible Redis um, implementation of a GraphQL cache that never really worked very well, but it at least solved some of our load problems and we weren't crashing every day anymore. And after Spectrum eventually got acquired by GitHub, I was like, why, why was that so difficult? Why, why is there no CDN for GraphQL, right? Like, why doesn't that exist? And in my head the whole time, when we were at Spectrum, really the question I was asking is, can't I, and this is famous last words, can't I just run a GraphQL client at the edge? Um, I've learned since then that every single time you say just in engineering, you're going to have a really bad time. Whatever you say, can't digest, 
there's no that's a that's a rabbit hole you're about to fall into that's going to be really really difficult to figure out but anyways if you look at graphql clients what graphql clients do in the browser is they cache graphql responses they look at the data that came back from the api and then they store it in some format on in, in your browser so that when you navigate around a website they can display that data that you've already fetched very similar to what remix loaders do and in my head i was like well graphql clients cache graphql data can i just take this the same thing that i already have in the browser and put it on a server and then ideally not just put it on a server but put it on 60 70 100 servers around the world so that the cache is really close to my user can i just put that data at the edge and in my head it seemed really simple to do that uh so let's take a quick look at how graphical clients actually cache and how graphical caching kind of works i have an example graphical query here which fetches a blog post and if it's a blog post by slug graphical itch caching and it fetches its id its title and then also its author and of the author we're fetching the id the name and the avatar and that's sort of the data we are going to try to load there's one important magic trick in graphql that makes graphql caching work and that trick is the underscore underscore type name meta field Every single GraphQL API exposes this automatically. And we can add it automatically to our query as well. So if, if we add the, this field to our query, it looks like this. Now, why that is important is because it tells us what the data is that we're about to fetch. If we look at what the API responds with here, it would look something like this, right? It would have the data for the post and then also the data for the author. And the important thing here is because of the underscore underscore type name meta field, we now know that this response from the server contains the post with the ID five, as well as the user with the ID one. Now we can take this response that we've just gotten from the server, we can put it in a cache, and the next time someone fetches, sends the same query to the server, we can respond with the same data. We don't need to go to the server again in the case of a GraphQL client. Now, it's really important that we understand what the data is that's being cached for invalidation, right? Imagine if somebody eventually submits an edit post mutation, right? And they're going to change the title of the post to how to edge cache GraphQL APIs. And then as a response to that mutation, they're going to fetch the fresh data of this post. Now, this mutation changes a post in the backend. We can again add the underscore underscore type name meta field to this mutation. And the data that comes back is the data of the post that we changed, right? And it has the new title. Now, what's important here is we just sent a mutation to the server. So the GraphQL client can look at what was just being sent in, a, in the request. It, it, and, and it knows, oh, you just sent a mutation. And back from that mutation came the data for the post with the ID five. So I can invalidate any cache query result that I have locally that contains the post with the ID five, because I know I know that this post just changed. You sent the mutation and that post came back. You changed this post. Let me just kick out any cache data that I have of this post. And that's incredibly powerful because it means you can have a cache, but automatically it'll invalidate whenever the data changes, which means you never end up with stale data, which is really, really, really powerful because the better your invalidation is, the longer you can cache things and the more things you can cache, right? TTL-based cachings where you essentially you say, I want to cache something for five minutes is great. But if your data changes more often than every five minutes, you have a problem because a comment, for example, on Facebook can't not show up for five minutes. That's Imagine if you type the comment and it took five minutes for that to show up. That would be a terrible terrible user experience. And so you really need invalidation in order to cache a lot of dynamic data. So this is really powerful. Now, unfortunately, there's one edge case where the magic of this mutation thing ends, which is list invalidations. If you imagine a query that fetches a list of blog posts, right? It, this, just, this just fetches whatever blog post we have on the back end. If we look at the response for this right now, this just has a single blog post. Um, and that's perfectly fine, right? Like this is our blog post with the ID5, how to edge cache GraphQL APIs. That's cool, perfect. We have that query, we have the data. That's all we wanted. Now the problem is when we send a mutation to the server that creates a new post, because whatever post we created isn't in the list, right? If we create a new post, what comes back from the API is a new post, but none of our cache query results contain the post with the ID six, right? If I go back to the list of posts that we just fetched earlier, it just has the post with the ID five. 
there was no post with the ID six yet. And so the mutation just ran, it returned, it created a new post, it returned the post with the ID six, but the GraphQL client can't know what to do now because there is no cache query result that contains the post with the, with the ID six. Now we, of course, we developers know, hey, we just created the post and this is a list of posts. So we'll actually probably go in there, uh, but the GraphQL client can't know that. And so for some of these edge cases, you have to implement manual invalidation. You have to tell the GraphQL client that the data has changed and what query results that are cached should be purged from the cache, should be deleted from the cache so that um, it doesn't have any stale data. For example, with Urkel, which is one of the, the biggest GraphQL clients, you have this updates configuration where you can say, okay, when a create post mutation is passes through you, then please, once it, once it is done, invalidate the, any cached query result that contains a list of posts, right? It's as simple as that. And that way, whenever a create post mutation happens, our posts list, our list of posts is invalidated and we know we get the fresh data. There's one more thing that GraphQL clients do that's kind of important to how they work, which is normalized caching. What I was talking about so far is called in the GraphQL community, document caching. It is document level caching because we're taking the entire document, the entire response, and we're caching the entire response. GraphQL clients nowadays are actually a, a little bit smarter than that. If we go back to our original query where we're fetching the post and the author of the post with the slug GraphQL edge caching, then if we look at the response, GraphQL clients don't take this entire thing and put it in the cache. They instead split up the data based on all of the different objects. In this response, we have the data for the post with ID five, but we also have the data for the user with the ID one. And normalized caching normalizes this into a, a format that's kind of similar to what databases would do. And they store each of these objects individually. So for example, in Urkel, the data looks a little bit like this. You have post with the ID five, and then the data for that post. And then you have the user with the ID one, and then the data for that user. And that's fantastic because that means when somebody now fetches, for example, the user with the ID one outside of the post for it with the ID five, the GraphQL client can know, oh, look, I have the user with the ID one in the cache already. I fetched this data before. Let me just return it to you. You don't need to go to the network for that. We already have loaded that data before. Now, you might notice that there's one thing missing here, which is the relation, right? The post the, of the post with the ID five, the author is the user with the ID one. And so, Urkel stores that in, an, in another data structure that's, it's, that is just responsible for remembering the links between things, the relations between things. That looks a little bit like this, where it's saying, okay, if we're fetching the post with this like graphical edge caching, then we got to return the data for the post with the ID5. If we're fetching the author of the post with the ID5, then that corresponds to the user with the ID1. And then the user with the ID1 just doesn't have any relations that we fetched so far, so it doesn't really matter. Now, what I really want the takeaway to be here is that GraphQL is really, really awesome for caching. Between the underscore underscore type name meta field and the split between queries and mutations, you can build really, really great caching with GraphQL much better than you can with many other systems. Now, to go back to my original question, can't I just run a GraphQL client at the edge? And we now know how GraphQL clients work. So in, in theory, you should be able to take pretty much the same code and run that at, on a server or even at the edge somewhere, right? But the, it's not quite as simple as that. And the main reason is authorization. If GraphQL clients work with the assumption that any data that they cache is accessible by anyone, since it's in your browser, any data that has been fetched before, you can... You, have, you are allowed to look at that data. You fetched it before, so they can just return it to you and that's perfectly fine. As soon as you start caching on the server or at the edge, that isn't true anymore because the whole point of doing that is that you wanna share the cache between many users, right? But maybe someone's loading their dark messages now, right? And in that case, no one else should be getting those cached query results. And so you have to deal with authorization. In a very simplified way, the way you can handle this is by changing the cache key to not just be the query, right? But also to include the authorization token. So 
people authenticate with an authorization header or with a cookie. And so you can take the value of that authorization header or of that cookie and add it to the cache key. And what that does is that only people with the same authorization token will get the same response. And so you can basically very effectively um, cache private data specifically to certain users. Now, there's even a step beyond that, which is even smarter would be to cache data per groups of users. Because very often in, for example, SaaS apps, you have a use case where you have a company and everyone from the company has access to the exact same data. But people outside of the company don't have access to the data at all. Now, if you were to take the authorization token in the cache key, every single person at that company, even though they can all access the same things, wouldn't be able to be served the cached query results. So you can make this a little bit smarter, but that is a, a, a basic solution that works. Take the authorization header, put it into the cache key. Then there's a second problem, which is global cache purging, right? Like we're talking about either a server somewhere or ideally even in, in many, many different edge locations spread all around the world that are very, very close to a user where the data is now in. Now the problem is a mutation passes through your edge cache what do you do now, right? Like you got to suddenly purge this data, invalidate any cache queries that contains this data globally, everywhere. Now, thankfully, we at GraphCDN did not have to solve this problem because this is a very, 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 very hard, very difficult problem to solve. Instead, we use Fastly's computed edge infrastructure. Fastly is a CDM provider. They've been around forever and they've basically spent the last 15 years or however long they've been around building the best infrastructure for caching at the edge. And if you look at their 70 locations, they're literally spread all across the world. And we can run our code on those 70 locations and we can cache very, very close to all of the users that our customers have. And that's fantastic. What's interesting is Fastly has managed to build global cache invalidation that only takes 150 milliseconds. So if, you, if, if a user sends a mutation through GraphCDM um, that for example, edits a post, then within 150 milliseconds, any cached query result that contains that specific post is deleted from any of the 70 worldwide locations that they had within 150 milliseconds. To put into perspective how fast that is, a human blink, so if I do this, that is 300 milliseconds, 200 to 300 milliseconds. So literally, faster than you can blink, fastly can invalidate data globally in more than 70 locations worldwide. Now that blew my mind when I first learned this. I did not know this. Um, and I actually looked up, how is that possible? Because what is the speed of light, right? There's, there's a, an upper limit to how fast things can go. And truly the speed of light isn't that fast. And it turns out to go around the globe once would take about 130 milliseconds if you were to go at the speed of light. But of course, our internet uh, routing is a lot slower than the speed of light. It's not quite that optimized yet. So how do they do it in 150 milliseconds? Well, they actually have a really smart gossiping algorithm that goes bi-directional. They go both ways around the globe at the same time. They don't go one way, they go in both directions at the same time, and they essentially invalidate any nodes that are near the original nodes. And then each of those nodes invalidates even more nodes around it. And so you can spread around the globe really, really quickly, which freaking amazing. Now, that really matters because if you have 150 millisecond fast invalidation, then you can cache a lot more data, right? If, if, if for example, again, you go back to the comment example, if someone posts a comment, you can't really have that not show up for minutes or even for, for example, 20, 30 seconds, right? It needs to show up immediately. If you can invalidate within 150 milliseconds, that means you can cache a lot more data. And on top of that, you can also cache it for longer because you know that it's gonna be gone when it is stale anyway. All right, so summary of everything I just said, caching GraphQL is awesome. GraphQL is incredibly, incredibly great for caching because of the underscore underscore type name meta field and the split between queries and mutations. However, caching GraphQL on the server for many users isn't as simple as it looks. And it's even more difficult once you move to the edge and you try to cache data close to your users. Um, and really you wanna think about authorization and you wanna think about cache purging globally so that your users have a great experience everywhere. All right, that's all I have for you today. Thanks so much for having me. Um, and I would love to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Max. Clapping emoji for Max in the chat. Brown, brown, brown. Um, 
That was great. Thanks, Max. I love, especially when you said very nonchalant, like, oh, the speed of light isn't that fast. <laughs> we want to be love faster, that. you know? You know, like uh, the, the, the upper limits. It's, it's our upper Matt limit, but we want to get there. <laughs> Um, all right, let's get to some questions. Uh, Michael asks, how often is manual invalidation needed in practice and does it create coupling with graph CDN? That is a fantastic question. Um, it is, uh, how do I answer this the best? It is definitely the most effort you have to put in, right? Putting graph CDN in front of your existing graph API is really fast. It's, it's a proxy, right? We, we send any requests you send to us back to your origin. So putting us in front of your GraphQL API requires signing up, inputting your GraphQL API URL, and then changing your GraphQL client to hit GraphCDN instead of your origin directly. So compared to that probably two minute process, depending on how difficult it is for you to, to change your GraphQL client's URL, um, the way more difficult part is the manual invalidation because you have to consider your entire schema, right? You have to consider your schema and then also where does data change? Most companies in production don't, have one place where data changes, right? That's never a thing. People have a website, a mobile app, an admin portal, they have background jobs, they have cron jobs, they have um, webhooks, they have many different ways that data can change. And that's not even talking about all of the third-party services. If, if you remember Ken's talk, um, he uses 20 different third-party services and the data in those can also change constantly. And so another piece of this is that really GraphCDN gives you very fine-grained control. You can easily put us in front of your GraphQL API and you'll get GraphQL analytics and error monitoring and performance tracking and all of that stuff. And then you can enable caching on a per type or per field basis, right? So you can say, okay, I know blog posts, if they're stale for five minutes, I don't really care. So I'm just gonna cache them for five minutes and then I have basic caching for those. Then as a next step, I'm going to think about, okay, where do blog posts change? I'm going to add invalidation in those places and I'm going to make sure that everything's invalidated correctly. And then suddenly I can now cache blog posts for much longer. I can set the, the max age to months or maybe even years, right? Um, and at that point you will get a much higher cache rate, much faster performance, much lower load on your service. That's great. And so you can go on a sort of per query basis and you can think through, okay, this part of the application, I really want that to be fast. How can I cache it? Where do I need to really think about the invalidation? Where do I need to put it? And you can consider it on a, on a very fine-grained level. Of course, there's some coupling there um, with GraphCDN, but so far, none of our users have really complained. It's an API call in the end, right? And so um, if, if you stop using GraphCDN, you can still send those API calls and it's not going to do anything. You just don't have anything cached anymore. So the coupling is there, but relatively minimal. Um, this is not a question, but David says that they're happy users of GraphCDN and Stately. Thank you, David. Uh, my very excited you that they is, use. <laughs> my question is, is Stately your favorite customer? Obviously. Of course. I what hope is. there's no other customers watching. <laughs> well, a lot of future customers, am I right? Hopefully, hopefully. Um, no, huge fans of Stately here. R Rhoda asks, is the order of the attributes in the query also a problem for caching? Great question. And the answer is yes and no. Um, it is a problem in the sense that if you change the order of the attributes, then your cache key changes, which means there wouldn't, that there wouldn't be a cache hit, which is a problem, right? And that's also something we're working on. It's the same thing applies if you were to reorder fields, um, right? If you reorder the fields, technically your cache key is different. So GraphCDN actually does a little bit of smart, or even if you change the white space, in theory, right? So GraphCDN that does some normalization under the hood, we order everything by alphabet and we remove all of the white space so that for those cases are accounted for. Still though, um, that can be a problem. The good thing is that in most or in many cases, the use cases our customers have is that they have a website or a mobile app and they send the same 20 or maybe 50 or maybe even 100 queries always, and they just change what the variables are. And so because of that, the order of the attribute is always the same, right? Like you have that hard coded in your client anyway. You don't send the same query with different order of attributes from your client it doesn't make any sense you have that client that query once and then you just change the variables when you need to but the order is usually the same which works out really nicely that isn't the case for use cases um, where you might have a public api right if you allow arbitrary queries to be sent to your api people will write arbitrary order of things and they will write arbitrary fields and they will write all kinds of arbitrary stuff and move things around and that's definitely a little bit more tricky but that's also something we focus on right we we want to make sure that you get the highest cash rate that's basically our main job and so to us it's really about okay how can we normalize these queries the best way possible so that you will get the highest cash rate
Awesome. That's so cool. Um, I obviously caching is a very difficult problem. Caching on the edge is a very difficult problem. Have you had like any massive things that have broken or massive outages <laughs> or like have, have there been any disasters just because that's like an easy place to get to with stuff like this? I think the, so thankfully we haven't had any outages yet. Um, if you remember the big Fastly outage, uh, maybe half a year or a year ago now, where basically half of the internet was down, we were also yeah. affected by that, of course, because we are based on Fastly infrastructure. But other than that, we haven't had any downtime yet. I think the biggest um, disaster we've had so far was exactly the question that Michael asked earlier, I think, where one of our users didn't think through invalidation carefully enough. And their content wasn't their their cache query results weren't purged when they should have been and so they were serving stale data to their users and then their end users the users of their website were complaining to them that their website was broken because they were seeing data that is five hours out of date and so that's one of the biggest um disasters i think that can happen with caching right it's just stale data which is why we focus so much on trying to make the invalidation easy um we have a lot more ideas on how to make that even easier but right now there's still the edge case particularly around lists that people have to deal with and have to reckon with and have to think through um, and that on us is a lot of means a lot of education um, and a lot of visibility and really talking about this so that people are aware right um, that's something we're always going to be working on and always going to be trying to make better uh, cash and validation as we all know is one of the two hardest problems in computer science so uh, lots of work to do there but we're it's our job now we're going to do it <laughs>